This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Before we get stuck into this week's episode, I'd like to invite you to help me. My podcast, The Politics of Everything, has been going since May 2017, and I've taken the plunge to enter, for the very first time, the Australian Podcast Awards. I need your help to try and get the popular vote. I actually need a thumbs up from you on their website. So I'll include a URL in the show notes, but please jump online, australianpodcastawards.com forward slash categories and there's a vote button. You then have to scan through to find the politics of everything with Amber Danes and hit like. You will have to register your details just so they know that you are a legitimate person, but I really appreciate your time. Now, let's get on with the show. Gender is something that defines us from the very second we're conceived. The doctors declare us a boy or a girl once we enter this world, and for most people it remains that way from birth to death. It also creates a lifetime of complexity in how we're spoken to, what perceived societal value we have, how much money we're likely to earn, and even whether we can get an education. This podcast explores the politics of gender, and my guest today is Beck Brideson, who for over two decades has been a pioneer and innovator in that marketing to women space. She helps other business owners and executives get a piece of the $28 trillion global female consumer market. From CEOs to sales departments, Beck is working along the pipeline to help businesses uncover the blind spots and financial upsides in the female economy and exploring gender diversity. Having spoken at many conferences throughout the world, Beck's raison d'etre is to improve the way modern business connects with the disruptive force of the female dollar. I love it. Welcome to the program, Beck. Hi, Amber. Great to be here. So this is obviously a very big topic and I'd love to just, um, if you can recall back to being a young girl, did you ever have a sense that being female was different? It was a big deal. Like were roles very gendered in your household sort of or society that you remember? Give us a little picture of, of your early childhood. Okay. So I went to nine schools. So, you know, nine different schools in 12 years made me the perennial new kid and the outsider. And it wasn't really gender that I noticed until around the early 80s and, and at a, as a grade five school girl, I started yet another school and I was one of the first students to go into a school that had traditionally been a 125-year male history Um, boys only school and they made it co-ed so I started to notice it a lot at that stage I noticed that aside from the uniforms it still seemed to largely be a curriculum that maybe was more suited to boys than girls everything from the you know the sports reports all of the old boards on the on the um, assembly hall that had boys' names, a, a lot of focus around cricket and football and not a lot of opportunity for girls to be seen as really successful in competing in international sports and, and that kind of, um, you know, really obvious, um, I guess, patriarchy existed. And then when I look back and I think, you know, the, the Bible, it's full of male characters and our school Um, our school books, our curriculum was very largely male driven. I studied art for years and we always studied male artists. So in retrospect, I can see that there were, it really just was the um, status quo. Absolutely. I do wonder sometimes how far we've come when it comes to that education piece. Interestingly, I'm I'm sure that your early career also had some gender divides, if you like. And I know for myself, I worked in a male newsroom um, in my early 20s, you know, post-university, pretty much was the only female business journalist on the floor at that time. 
and it did have impact me. So do you have a career moment where you thought, wow, this is this is really going to be hard or this is going to be challenging? Well, the, the t- moment I decided I wanted to be in advertising was when I watched Bewitched. And you know, I really loved the job that Darren had. But even when I think about the, the TV diet that I had back then, it was I Dream of Jeannie, it was Bewitched. And there you go, there's two magical goddess women who kept the, you know, the home in, in place while the men went out to, um, to work. You know, one was an astronaut and, and Darren had a job in advertising. But that was when I really had that moment, I want to work in advertising. I want to come up with ideas that help people sell things. So um, when I got into the industry, yeah, I, I, again, I didn't see it necessarily overtly to begin with. Um, and certainly not as much as I see it now in, in hindsight. But my first six months as a junior, as an unpaid intern, I mean, there was some, some massive harassment that uh, you just had to suck, suck up because you were um, – suck it up because you were lucky to be in there. You know, that was the idea is if, if this is a competitive industry and if you're in, then you just take what's put out there if you want to stay in the industry um, and I guess as I got older, as I got into my first time, my first full time role, um, there were there were comments. There were you know, wear short skirts, flirt with our clients. There was an assumption, um, as you know, probably a decade into my career, that uh, if you're in the boardroom, you were possibly the EA. And uh, I think people just weren't used to seeing women in the boardroom unless they were in those roles where you were support rather than um, C-suite. And, you know, that really made me wonder about, you know, what is it that they think that women add? What sort of value are they adding? And I felt that there were a lot of times where perhaps, um, you know, the, the assumption was I was fair game. And and what did that say about my brain what did that say about what I had to offer what was the value that I was bringing and it certainly seemed that women did not um, bring the value that my male counterparts did and I was very often the only female in the creative departments Um, and then as I got older and more senior this sort of behavior became more covert and it was sort of insidious and there was a lot of um, manipulation, I guess, around um, the entitlement of the of the men, and in in the end, I was um, one of three percent of women in advertising to reach the role of creative director, and which is a huge achievement. And I, I do want to stop you there because you've been in the industry a long time, and I guess then you know that's a bit of a novelty to have reached that that really senior role as a female in a male-dominated world. I always picture Mad Men when I think of advertising and I've had enough experience with advertising agencies to know the hierarchies that you're talking about. You've also won numerous international awards and you have been recognised for your work, which I think is the key point here that it's your work that's speaking volumes. And I guess did you ever feel like you had to pedal harder because of those whether they're overt or not, biases in the industry. Yes, and I do think I I learned a, a lot of my mentors and the people that I learned my craft from were males. I mean, there were, there were no females in the role that I wanted and so I had to naturally look to, to the way the males behaved and, and what, um, what was acceptable and how did they think. And so I learned to look through a male lens and – and I learned how to think like them and act like them and speak like them to a degree. I'm not, I'm not saying that I totally lost myself, but I was aware that I was losing myself as we got, um, as I got older and that there were no women and that if there were women, they, they, as soon as they had children, they left the workforce and um, they weren't welcomed back. So it was definitely a case of me, um, you know, I, I sort of joke that I'm a recovering misogynist because I even would write advertising concepts that had the usual cliches of woman at home or woman as um, objectified and man as the um, the hero in in the work that I was producing. And 
that was the way to get my work seen and th- through the um, the clients. And any time I tried to put women into those powerful positions, they'd say, "No, that doesn't that doesn't work." You know, that's not that's not the way the world that's not the way we work. That's not the way we sell our products. And that's when I started to see there was a problem with gender and the way we were perpetuating old gender stereotypes. Interestingly, you found an opportunity in that though. And I know on the back of this wealth of experience you had in advertising, you identified a gap in agency attitudes and processes within this so-called female market. And I know that when you started your agency, Venus Comms, in 2004, things might have seemed like it was going to be, you know, an opportunity, but probably a bit of a battle too. I'm curious to know, has the state of play really improved in that 14 years since you started the business? And what kind of work do we still need to do to level this playing field, not just in advertising, but in so many workplaces across the planet? Yeah, well, in advertising specifically, um, a survey was done last year with all of the agencies, and we've still got a, a great big bias and heavy representation of males. Um, So that hasn't improved and uh, a staggering 42% of female employees across agencies report that they've experienced sexual harassment, um, 20% who've experienced it a couple of times. So uh, there's that side of, you know, let's call that an HR issue. Um, But from a business perspective, you know, this, this is a problem because we're not having enough access and women aren't being given enough opportunity to be able to bring their insights and wisdom to a world that is still very male lensed and that's that's the concept of um, female lens thinking is not that you have to be a female to use a female lens male or female can use it I mean I plainly learned to use a male lens in order to to succeed early in my career but um, an attitude that allows for us to start thinking differently about the needs of men and the needs of women, uh, not only as workforce but as consumers, and that's where I see this really big opportunity. That's fascinating, and obviously you've you've made a great living out of it. And I love this mantra that happy women equals a bigger basket and, and lifetime of loyalty. It sounds like there's a great economic reason why engaging women in in the process is so key. Would you like to give us some examples of why it's good for the wider economy? Because sometimes I think when there's some financial incentive, if you like, it's more likely to happen because men and women will both buy into that. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, if... um if you think about Melinda Gates, she has said that we're sending our daughters into workplaces built for our fathers. So we are existing and we have received a history of this um, of business that has had men build it and they've built it as best as they can. And yes, we have been creating and selling products for women since business has begun. But here is a moment, here is a disruption in the marketplace to say we've received all of this wisdom, but how about we create some new wisdom around women's needs and wants and desires because we've come so far as a society where more women are working, they're working full-time or they're working part-time and they're still juggling their household. So how can we better approach um, the the products and the services that we're offering in order to better cater for a new and modern society where gender balance is, um, you know, a, a hot topic and something that really can add value to the bottom line. Um, women are the biggest purchasers and they're going to be worth 75% of the discretionary spend or, or they'll be making um, those decisions in households within the next decade. So if women are responsible for driving those purchasing decisions, how can we better meet their needs? Yeah, I think that's key. And I'm thinking of so many industries, that's true. My background is in communications and public relations agencies. And I remember many years ago doing a campaign for, I reckon it's 15 years ago, Borrow Bricks. So for our overseas listeners, it's it's one of the major brick house building companies in Australia and suppliers. 
And we worked out that we needed to put sample bricks in packs that women could carry home because they, at the end of the day, were making the decisions about what colour and style of bricks were going into new house builds. So, and that was a real change of thinking for this company that was very male, had had a lot of blokey imagery um, and all their communications reflected, oh, well, you know, men build houses. But really, they weren't making the decisions. So, what you're saying has a lot of merit because I think that's a that's a truth and the more people embrace it, obviously it's going to be better for, for the bottom exactly. line as well. And, and that's a great example and, and I was going to say, you know, give me an example of one of your favourite brands, one that you absolutely love and that you're, you're committed to and that you would never, ever choose anything other than that. Yeah, Are you asking yeah. me to do that? We're playing? Oh, wow, <laughs> the questions are on me. This is so unusual. Uh, a brand that I totally love, I would have to say... Gosh, it's really hard when you put me on the spot with these categories. Okay, I'm going to say Adidas, Adidas okay. products, shoes, sports gear, right. all so of it. So if you had the choice of um, Nike or Reebok or, or any of the other big brands, you would still say, no, I love Adidas. I would believe so. I can be swayed. Okay. But, yes, I would so say I so. Would, I, would give, I would give that analogy then. If you could be swayed, then maybe you're more like you're, you're dating that product, but something that you're absolutely married to. And, and I've got an example um, of, of Mecca as a, you know, a, a cosmetic uh, or a, um, a, a shop that I will only go to if I'm buying cosmetics. And Milo, I'm an absolute Milo fan. So, you know, since I was a kid, I've, I've eaten it and then I've, I've got my kids onto the same thing. And I won't look at any other chocolate flavored sprinkles for, for milk. It has to be Milo. So I say I'm married to it and I'm a lifetime loyal customer. So I am of great value to them. Um, but there are other, other brands that, and, and other products that you have in your life. And I'd say, you know, if you think about, um, products that you totally ignore, that you wouldn't, even contemplate buying them. And for me, that's something like Samsung because I'm an Apple person. So I'm just like, I'm, I married Apple and that's my brand and that's who I look at. So I actually ignore other brands. They don't even register on my, um, on my radar. And then there are brands that you tolerate. And, you know, for me, they're supermarket brands, you know, whether it's Coles or Woolies or Aldi, I don't care. You know, it's sort of, I have to choose from, from those kinds of, um, places and that's where I go I would love I know so many ways they could improve my experience and my relationship with their brand and there are also brands that you you have a repertoire of and I'd say that's a bit like flirting with those brands you know you'll go between like for my kids clothes you know cotton on seed Kmart witchery you know I'll sort of shop them all but when a woman loves a brand like I said with with Milo or you with Adidas you just don't go anywhere. So in terms of marketing and an effort to reach me and to meet my needs, um, I'm loyal and I'm going to tell my friends that I love these brands and I'm going to recommend that brand. But when you've decided you're, you're just ignoring them or tolerating them, tolerating I say is a bit like the way Melania and Donald Trump live their relationship, you know. <laughs> We're assuming, but yes, all the evidence is uh, is in that in yeah. that realm, isn't and then it? And when you're dating them, it's like when when Sophie chose um, to chose Stu from The Bachelor. You know, she's she's chosen him, and she's seeing, and she might marry him and make make the dedication. But you know, this this concept that um, brands can be like the relationship that women have with with people is a, a really good way of saying, well, where are we with women? You know, what do that, do they love us? Do they flirt with us or are they tolerating us? And, and if they're only tolerating us, what do we need to do in order to make ourselves more loved by them? You know, how do we move them up into that um, loyal relationship I know in your book, Blind Spots, How to Uncover and Attract the Fastest Emerging Economy, you do have a special methodology to help other businesses achieve those kind of results with the female spend, if you like. I know that you've said that it's all about being able to get businesses to get women or understand women. And then that means there's going to be better marketing spend. And those examples you've just shared really drive that home. I guess in some ways, is the so-called female dollar always going to impact a company's bottom line or is it just 
a nice to have? I mean, how imperative is this realisation yeah, so in, in, from your perspective? It'll from- be different for everyone's business and that's the first step is to say, well, you know, if how, how much percent of the female market do you have and what are they spending in categories? So let's say for new cars, women are buying and influencing 80% of new car purchases. And so if you are Volkswagen and you have only um, 40% of the female market, well, then you could see that you're actually missing out on a lot more potential market. So what would you need to do to make yourself better connected to a potential market? Uh, Understand who is spending the money and how can you deliver them more of what they want? And when you look at the money that you're missing out on by ignoring meeting their needs or understanding them or connecting with them, it might be that you have a great product but you're just not connecting with them properly with your communications. These are the things that increase your sales and increase, like I said, the loyalty, you know, over a lifetime. And there's some really easy wins to be had. Other products perhaps are missing out on such or products or brands are missing out on such a big part of their market that it takes a little more, you know, it takes a little more understanding of what isn't the product delivering that women would want more. So it really is, I mean, it sounds like it's a a difficult process, but the basics are, have you got as many women purchasing in your category? Have you got them purchasing your brand? And if not, let's start fixing it. It's great. It makes sense. So simple. So simple. Just go and do it, everybody. I guess I'd like to change tack a little bit. The past year's been really focused on they saying, well, basically 2018 is the year of year of the woman, the unspoken year of the woman. But there's some really serious female-centric issues which have come to the fore in reaction perhaps to the rise of Trumpism and, if you like, backlashes in the wake of the Me Too campaign that launched across Hollywood in 2017 and spilled over into the mainstream. What kind of lasting impact do you think this is really going to have on equality for women in all walks of life? And I guess that gender divide between men and women, is this going to be something that goes away and everything goes back to normal once, you know, the the media dies down? Or do you think this has a catalyst for something bigger that benefits both men and women? um, I think it's here to stay. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. And um, you know, we are in an age of disruption and, and that's normally we think of disruption as being around digital and technology and, you know, artificial intelligence and the, the onslaught of driverless cars. But gender is proving to be a massive disruption and the Me Too campaign is a, is a good case in point for that because women are starting to see that across the globe being invisible isn't okay anymore and having faced mistreatment or or even you know it doesn't have to be um, harassment or misogyny it just might be a male bias or a, or a gender bias um, women aren't going to take it quietly anymore you know whether it's in the workplace the marketplace or in the home men are actually being held accountable now and women are starting to realize the power of their voice but but the nice link I like to make from there is it's not just our voice that's powerful when you think about that figure that that you mentioned in the introduction 28 trillion of the global consumer economy uh, and that by 2028, we will be making 75% of um, decisions of the discretionary spend in our home. Women actually have such power in their wealth. And if we as an aggregate decided to make our decision to, or to move our decisions and our dollars away from companies that aren't supporting women, that aren't seeing it the way um, women need and demand and, and want greater support and more choice and products that deliver to them. You know, if women all acted together and let's say they stopped buying cars from companies where there are no women in upper management or let's say we all moved our money to banks um, that were pro-female and had gender equal boards, I think they would pretty quickly realise they need to answer the call of gender discrimination. So at Oh, totally. I, I can see the argument. It makes so much sense. I guess it's it's that thing of I hope it all spills into what you're talking about and it doesn't just become, 
you know, a bit of a phenomenon which in a year's time we've all fatigued of and, you know, things go back to yeah, what we Yeah, and don't I see want. why there is fatigue because um, gender is such a – it's a hot topic and it's a hot potato because there's a lot of confusion between what harassment is versus what flirting is. There's confusion around does gender mean we have to have an equal workforce or does gender mean that it's about seeing things in a gender balanced way through both male and female lens and being able to cater the right way to our end user or to our consumer. And there's there's a lot of businesses that are popping up now that are working in this space and and one of them is Fem Economy. I'm not sure if you if you've heard of them, but yeah, I so have, there you go. Indeed. There's a website and they are signing up brands who want to um announce to the rest of the world that yes, we we've got gender balanced teams, we've got gender fair workplaces, and so this is giving women and men a choice that if you want to support companies that are pro gender balance, then shop a Fem Economy um, approved brand. And I think this is the start of something pretty big, sustaining the change that is much needed in order to have, you know, a better a better economy for everyone. Absolutely. One of my former podcast guests is Dr. Michael Kimmel. He actually calls himself the world's most prominent male feminist. He actually has a very famous quote saying that privilege is largely invisible to those who have it, which I think we all agree with. And that's whether you're, you know, a powerful white man, if you like, who's, you know, had a lot of, if you like, inherent benefits of of just being who you are. There are other examples of that as well. But I guess my question to you is how important is it to have meaningful discussions with men to change these attitudes as well? Because I feel, I mean, I love working with men. A lot of my clients are men and I have to admit, I not I don't feel sorry for them, but I do feel like it's going to be a loss if we don't take them on this journey with us. So I would be curious to know about your thoughts on engaging leaders who predominantly are men on, on this journey as well so that they can support it and we can get a mutually beneficial yeah, outcome. Yeah, I completely agree that this is something that we have to work side by side to change. Um, it's not going to happen unless men are part of the movement and if you think of a ladder imagine a ladder and on the bottom rung is is people who don't think this way people who aren't interested in gender it's just not on their radar or they're not interested in it they they're comfortable as as you said um Dr. Kimmel said that, you know, their their privilege is invisible, so it just doesn't register for them. And I'd call them a late adopter. And then go up a few rungs of the ladder to the top and you'll see people who are absolutely, you know, they are outthinking their competition because they've realised that if they are only serving half of the population, then they're going to be missing out on a lot of, and it's not just half the profit if women are responsible for, you know, up to 75% of spend, they are missing out on a really big opportunity to connect with the people and that they are the early adopters of this. So, I love working with the men who are enlightened, who are woke, who are ready for, to have these discussions and say, right, let's put about fixing this and making the most of the opportunity that is awaiting us. But there's a lot of people in between as well, you know, everything from um, companies that are group thinking and really not taking any notice of it to those who are rethinking and often I go into a business when they're rethinking their attitudes towards gender and um, possibly rethinking why are they number three or number four in the category when, you know, what is number one doing that is so much better? And, um, you know, working with, with people who are ready to have their blind spots illuminated is such a satisfying experience. And I've learned recently that if the leaders don't see it, I'm not going to be able to convince them, you know. They're, they're the late adopters and there's no changing their minds right now. Absolutely. I always ask my questions to my, my guests, two final questions, and I'd love to get your feedback on these. Do you have any special mentors or inspirational people that have guided you? And if so, who are they and what have you, they taught you? About I have life? had so many of them, so I probably can't name them. <laughs> You'll have to just pick one, one major one, and I guess what the well, takeout my, would be. My belief is that, you know, the student appears when 
sorry, the teacher appears when the student is ready. So, you know, throughout my time, I've had lots and I kind of curate a lot of people. But look, globally, people that I, I watch and admire sort of, you know, in a space of um, spirituality and life. I love Danielle Laporte and Glennon Doyle and Tammy Simon. I think, you know, they help me ground myself so that I can be a better business person and a better mother and a better wife and you know it really for me is about curating the best from people who are doing amazing work and and having a look at how it works for me absolutely final question last advice what would be your best tip to anyone else who wants to succeed in the politics of well, gender. I think gender is showing us the subject, the awakening that we have. It's showing us that it can really impact the world and how um, we have relationships and how we do business and how our society operates. And that gender shouldn't be something that people shy away from and think it's it's too hard and it's it is that political hot potato and it's going to throw up all of these different uh, emotions from people who are experienced gender in a different way. I think it can actually be the difference. I think the difference in men and women should be celebrated and loved and should be seen as a way to create new opportunities, which ultimately, you know, if you can reimagine your business from ground zero through a female lens, reimagine it through a male lens and work out how can we best serve our society? What changes can we make? And how how do we make equal and better changes that accommodate everyone and are, that are good for everyone? And there's not nothing to be frightened of from segmenting your market into male and female. It's not a discrimination issue. It's actually an opportunity. I love your positivity and it's made me a lot more hopeful for the future. If you do want to connect further with Beck, I'll have some details on my show notes. Until next time, keep well. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespokecoms.com. That's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.